Uh, Jordan Reed, draft expert from ESPN series in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, do you like Mobile, Alabama, Jordan Reed? I love it. Like, I only come here one week out of the entire year, but it's such a tight-knit area. We have Mardi Gras actually starting today yes. out here. I did not know. So the first, I came to Mobile the first time, like, four years ago, and my Uber driver is like, hey, do you know where Mardi Gras originally started? And I'm like, no. And he's like, you're in the city right now. I was like, seriously? <laughs> I never knew Mardi Gras originally started in Mobile, Alabama. So, that's like their pride and joy. Like every time I come here now, all of my Uber drivers tell me this is where Mardi Gras originated. They never say anything about the Senior Bowl. Mardi Gras is always the first thing that they mention. I spent a bunch of, of Januarys and early Februarys in, in Mobile before. I really like it. It's a it's a you know it's a nice area. The weather's okay. It's a little cold this time of year. I like the downtown yeah. area. Um what I do find funny, especially this time of year. It's a coaching convention, and there's a lot of guys who are trying to get jobs. And you'll see guys, and I don't want to air anybody out here, but like, see guys who like matter in football, and they're just like networking, just like you and me, being like, "Hey, got any defensive backs jobs openings?" And it's very <laughs> funny to see all that all go. And the other funny thing I think about a lot is I was there like three or four years ago, and there were a couple guys who had just been fired, and they're wearing their team gear of the team that fired them. I was talking to somebody in the bleachers and I was like, man, what are these guys doing wearing polos? The team that just fired him. They're like, man, something you need to learn about the NFL. There's no loyalty except free gear. That's it. They just want free <laughs> gear. They just, so you'll just see like some, some defensive coordinator wearing it's like, what the hell is he wearing that sweater for? Um, all right. So anyway, let's, let's get to this. Um, draft stuff. I, it's, it's, it's draft season for most people. Uh, I used to have yeah. a, uh, this is the most reductive thing in the world. I used to have an editor at the Wall Street Journal. He used to joke like, no one cares about the Super Bowl. Because for 30, 30 teams, they're just like, <laughs> what are we doing in free agency? Yeah. Who are we losing? And who are we replacing? And I know that sounds crazy when 100 million people watch a game. But like, yeah, it matters sometimes. Um, so let's start here. Uh, the first couple, the, the, the buzz at the Senior Bowl. I know that sounds like a joke. But like the buzz at the Senior Bowl, the story, everybody's talking about the player, whatever, is what, Jordan? So, yeah, I mean, everything's going to start with the quarterbacks, right? And the yeah. funny thing about today, the last day of practice at the Senior Bowl, so the national team, which is the first team that practices every day, they're in the middle of practice, and then everybody just starts whispering. So you can tell that everybody just got the Schefter report about Dan Quinn being hired in Washington. Ooh. So you just see, like, everybody whispering around. Nobody's paying attention to the players anymore. So I thought that was pretty interesting of, like, everybody has Adam's tweets immediately sent to their phone and everybody's just flashing <laughs> their phones like this and like hey did you get that and so I thought that was pretty funny so the Washington hire was really the buzz of practice today but as far as players there's plenty that stood out um to Lisa Bawaga who was a massive offensive tackle from Oregon mm. State projected to be a top 15 pick uh, he looked really good Liatu Latu who was a defensive end from UCLA who was also projected to be a top 15 pick as well. And whenever you have those players playing in an event like this, I always say you want first round picks to look like projected first round picks. They should be able to stick out immediately when you see these guys. So those were two guys that really stuck out. But one who I thought was the best player here, regardless of position, was Quinion Mitchell. He's a cornerback from Toledo. Mm -hmm. And there were some question marks as far as how quickly he would respond to the speed of the game, especially being a nine power five prospect. That's always the big worry or something that you look for that first day of practice, but he didn't practice today, but those first two days he practiced really good. And third day he was like, okay, I'm done. Y'all seen what you need to see. I'm done. Yeah. So um, I, I thought he was really, really good. He helped himself a lot. It's funny because I think late in the process, the idea of someone climbing up draft boards or falling is a misnomer. Like whenever you hear a report that like on April 14th, it's like, Oh, this guy's getting a lot of butts. Like now nah, a lot of teams yeah. like make their decisions, but this is the time senior bowl practice, the all-star games, then obviously the testing next month. That's when we have a lot of risers and fallers. Um, this is like, there's probably a six week span where in my opinion, everything is determined um, because there's a lot of guys who have tape and then they test poorly. They'll get knocked down or some guy just comes on. I mean, for God's sakes, Daniel Jones, you know, impressed yeah, Dave Gettleman yeah. so much. He became a top 10 pick at the senior bowl. Like this is rising and falling season with that in mind. We'll do both categories. Is there someone, and this is not specific to the senior bowl, but is there someone right now who in the process in the, in the all-star games, whatever has risen. We'll do a couple people if you need to, uh, who has risen sharply the last couple of weeks, last couple of days. 
Yeah, so there's one prospect that's here that scouts just could not stop talking about. His name is Darius Robinson. He's a defensive lineman from Missouri, six foot five, two hundred and eighty-five pounds. And so the first day of practice, I walk up and I stand beside him. So it's him and Tavondre Sweat. And I'm sure you know who Tavondre Sweat is. He's like mm-hmm. six five, three hundred and sixty pound defensive lineman from Texas. So I stand beside Robinson and I'm like, Oh my God, this dude is huge. Like you didn't look that big in film, but <laughs> You don't really realize how big these guys are until you get up and stand beside them. So Darius Robinson was one name that scouts just could not stop talking about. So he kind of was projected like top 50 coming into the event. But now I would be surprised if he got out the back end of the first round. Ooh, is there a type of role type of scheme where you say, okay, this could be immediate, even a type of team where you say that could be a good fit? So the best way that I can describe it, he's like Baltimore Ravens, Pittsburgh Steelers type of defensive lineman of where um, he just has heavy hands. He can beat you up at the line of scrimmage. He can take advantage of tight ends. You can play him any position along the defensive line. And that's what we've seen with both of those defensive lines. So I think his versatility, his scheme, flexibility, and just also the pro ready of his body right now, I I think those are two teams that are going to like him a lot. Unfortunate follow up the the fallers obviously and and a lot of it could be medical I mean that that's that's a huge thing this time of year it could be in some cases uh, you know interviewing but that doesn't happen that starts now but then obviously extends for six weeks we may not know all of that stuff but is there a guy where it's like okay this guy got a lot of buzz during the season and he's falling now well I don't well I'll just stick to the senior bowl I don't think it was one particular guy I think it was a group as a whole and it was the quarterbacks I I had Mm -hmm. a lot of hope coming to the event especially with Bo Nix and Michael Penix Jr. being on the same team this was kind of like built up to be the trilogy between those two guys and (laughs) I just yeah it, it just was really underwhelming and it's tough for quarterbacks just because you're throwing to new guys you just met on the plane or the trip over to the senior bowl yeah, uh, prior to you never met any of these guys. So you're throwing the brand new targets. This is the first time some of these guys have called an actual play verbatim in a huddle, just because everything's so signal based in college. And then also you're getting used to those new surroundings and there's hundreds of scouts hovering over the field. So I don't know if it was nerves. There was a lot of accuracy struggles. Um, there just wasn't a lot of chemistry with the quarterbacks and it was a little bit underwhelming. I was looking forward to seeing that group. Um, and it was just really underwhelming overall. What are NFL teams? I, I think I know the answer to this, but you know far more than me because you follow the draft and, and the listener is curious. Well, like what are so obviously every, just in case somebody doesn't know, the game does not matter. The practices do because the the, the teams are, are standing. I mean, the game is nice. And I remember going to the game a couple of years ago. and I think the Raiders mm-hmm. were the only team that was actually had stayed for the game. And the reason was mm-hmm. it was actually uh, <laughs> I was staying in the South and I was going to uh, just take a quick flight over. So it's like, well, it's all start for the game. And I think uh, I think it was like the Reggie McKenzie era Raiders were yeah. the only team that stayed for the game. Um, but the practices are important and guys want to be on the field. There was a great photo. I don't know if you saw it of, of Mike Tomlin just like sipping a coffee and just yeah. watching players. He was he was all into it. Tomlin was all all in practice. So what what exactly um, do these guys get out of it? And what are they? You know, when you're standing next to a coach, what are they looking for in these reps? Is it um, are they looking for team reps? Are they looking for just one on one stuff to to see strength and technique? Like, take me through these All Star games and and what a coach is trying to get out. I know it's position kind of uh, specific, but just just broadly, we can go we can go from there. So the analogy that I always like to use is it's like shopping for a car online. So you're looking at a car. It looks great. You can see the exterior. You can see the miles. You can see the body and things like that. But when you get to this event, now it's like going to the dealership. I can test drive it. Mm -hmm. I can pop up the hood and see the engine. I can see the interior. So this is the part where you're going to the dealership just because you're getting to know the person. What is their personality like? How are they at practice? Are they more quiet, reserved, or... Are they, are they one of those guys that really likes to jump talk? And you see that competitive edge with them. And then also the meeting piece, that's a big piece or a big part of the process too. So you're getting to know the person and they're not having formal meetings like they have at the combine. So right. there's a big room. There's like 15 to 20 guys walking around and it's basically speed dating. So there's 10 teams walking around in the room and they're basically trying to shake hands and get to know these guys quickly as possible. It's literally 10 to 15 minutes of speed dating to try to get to many guys as possible and just asking them random questions. We hear about the random questions or the weirdest questions that they get every single year. So that's where you hear some of those weird questions, but also there's some scheme specific things 
But at the combine, that's really where those formal meetings start and they get to have those sit downs. They can get on the whiteboard with them. But here is really just speed dating. But at practice, you're really just body typing is what I like to call it, how their body looks. Um, and then also just how they move around as far as their athleticism. Um, last time you were on this show, we talked about the two quarterbacks, obviously. And then we talked about Marvin Harrison, which I think it we thought was looking like it was going to be the the first top three at that point. So much has changed because of Jaden Daniels and the fact that it looks like, at least at the end of the season, it looked like it was going to go one, two, three. And the Patriots and Gerard Mayo seem to be already suggesting they're going to take a quarterback, which I've never really seen before. It's someone picking three. I remember like Ryan Grigson didn't say he was taking Andrew Luck to like the morning of, and then they yeah. announced it. They're like, yeah, we're going to take Andrew Luck. And Gerard Mayo was like, yeah, we're going to take a very important position, wink, wink, which I think is a very, <laughs> very funny way to go about it. Um, so, uh, so much has changed, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you. The top three picks in the draft, are they all quarterbacks? I was there originally, but now the Dan Quinn hire and then also Gerard Mayo, it makes things really interesting. And Mm -hmm. I still think Washington is going to take a quarterback, but New England is really interesting to me just because if you look at that roster on offense, it's really, really bad. Like they need receivers. They're going to need multiple offensive linemen. And then of course you still don't have a quarterback either. So maybe you look at Atlanta at eight or Minnesota at 11 or somebody like that and say, Hey, let's slide back a couple spots, get some picks for next year, take a defensive player or take a wide receiver or somebody like that. And then just try to build it up over time, as opposed to putting a quarterback in a disadvantageous situation with no weapons, questionable protection. And then I'm in year one of a first year head coach too. So I think New England's really interesting, but also Dan, the Dan Quinn hire makes things really interesting too, just because, Will he want a rookie quarterback or will he want a veteran? We know he's going to get better on defense. He's a defensive-minded head coach. So they're going to try to bring the defensive pieces in there. But does he feel as if uh, he wants a rookie quarterback as they're building this strong defense? So last time we talked, that second and third pick gets really, really interesting now that we know the higher in both spots. Okay, so let's say you're Jonathan Kraft or – Whoever, whoever Gerard Mayo, uh, whoever they hire a GM, so they don't have one right now, or Gerard Mayo decides, all right, we're not going quarterback. Give me some names that would be maybe more valuable than Jaden Daniels if if they just said we're just we're just not going to force it with the quarterback thing. We're going to try to build. Like who is, would it be? Harrison? Would it be? Is there a defensive player that comes to mind? So I don't know if we're going to get a defensive player inside the top ten, honestly, especially if Atlanta doesn't take one at eight or the Bears don't take one at nine. Um, I just don't know. I don't see any spots for a defensive player to be selected. Receivers and tackles. And then, of course, we have the one tight end and Brock Bowers, who potentially could be a top 10 pick as well. So Minnesota at 11 could be the first area. Um, I I would be surprised if they don't take a defensive player, if they don't go quarterback. So maybe Minnesota at 11. But um, the defensive ends, I think, could be very high on a lot of teams' boards. We talked about Leatu Latu of UCLA a little bit earlier, who who practiced the first two days at the Senior Bowl, looked really good. Dallas Turner at Alabama, uh, who's kind of your upside-y type of pick. And then also Jared Verse of Florida State, um, who has mixed reviews a little bit right now. I would project more so top 20 for him right now as opposed to top 12. But those are your three guys that could go at the top of the draft. And then Alabama has a corner, Tyrion Arnold, that has a lot of buzz right now that Scott's really like. Is that uh, – well, actually, let's stay on verse here for a second. I thought it was interesting because I watch a lot of big three Florida football, so I know a lot of the prospects. Jared Verse, at the beginning of the season and the middle of the season, to me, on tape, was really underwhelming. Really underwhelming. And I thought, like, ooh, boy, like, should he have come back? And I had some people – who knew that I watched a lot of these games and they were just like, man, if you're Jared verse, I know the NIL part of it is important. And, and Florida State did a nice job with that last off season saying to their guys, Hey, here's a good amount of money that can get you somewhere. You enjoy living in Tallahassee. Let's run this back. I understand that part, but somebody was like, it's really hard to, ma- if you're a top 10 pick, it's really hard to, to go, you know, to maximize your value as a, as a defensive end, just go, just go. I had a couple people say that to me. And then so I'm thinking, Ooh, he made a mistake. And then in the last couple of games, uh, Louisville, Florida, after Jordan Travis got hurt, mm-hmm. it felt like he just said, I'm just, okay, I'm the best player on, on the 
this team and I'm going to put the team on my back. And I was, I ended up being hugely impressed, but as you said, that ends up being a mixed grade for me because you end up being underwhelmed for 10 games. And then you see them be completely dominant in, in the latter, in the late, later stages of the season. I just don't know. And then there's a bunch of guys on Florida state like that. Keon Coleman was pretty inconsistent all year. Yeah. Um, there, I, 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 it's a hard team to get a read on. And also, frankly, ACC ball, it's a little harder to kind of get a read on what that looks like because just not as strong as the SEC. The FSU guys, to me, are um, I could peg them almost anywhere. Yeah, I agree. Um, there's mixed opinions on Keon Coleman right now. We got off to a really good start, but kind of struggled a little bit down the back stretch of the year. And there's similar opinions with Verse. So I saw Verse three times this year. I saw him against Clemson. I saw him against Louisville and then also Wake Forest. And he was good in all of those games. He got off to a slow start just because he was getting some extra attention. There was a lot of schemes that were catered to him. And then some other players emerged along the defensive lineman, Braden Fisk, who was a Western Michigan transfer. He really came on down the back stretch of the year. So I think it was just a little bit of him getting a little extra attention. And then also he just was finishing better down the back stretch of the year. But I mean, like his hands, man, they're just so heavy. Like I compared it to a heavyweight boxer. Like, they're just ridiculously heavy. And that Louisville game and the ACC title game, it was really good. Wake Forest was one of his better games, too, as well. So I think top 20 is probably a good range for him right now. But I I think he's the most pro-ready of those top three just because he's going to give you versatility as a pass rusher. Now, he's not as bendy as Turner or Leatu Latu. I don't think he's the athlete that those guys are. But as far as run defense, the combination of run defense and pass rush, he's going to give you the total package with both of those. Well, he's also a different type of athlete. I mean, like, yeah, you're t- he was not a power five athlete coming out of college, or, right. sorry, out, of, out of high school, he's an Albany transfer, right. all that stuff. Like, it's a completely different. He developed from Albany, then went to Florida State. Like, it, you know, it, it's it's a completely different. It, that's what's funny to me about the portal now is you're getting these guys where it's like, okay, they're not the bet. They're not going to reset the spark scores here because of these guys, but they're being highly productive at the lower levels of football, they go and they, they learn from you know, P5 weight rooms and nutrition and all that stuff and then skills and then they get even better. So it's interesting to see. Why should you bet with Caesar Sportsbook? Two words, Caesars Rewards. Every bet brings you closer to the types of benefits only Caesars can offer. Hotel stays, VIP experiences, sports and concert tickets, and more. It's not just an app, it's an empire. I want to ask about the fact that there are there might not be a defensive player in the top 10. Is that luck? Is that just a bad gear? Is that just the way the game is trending with how many good receivers there are, how many good tackles there are, how many good quarterbacks? Is it just, it just happens to be this year there's no dominant Miles Garrett type at the top? It's a combination of that. And then there's just so many teams that need quarterbacks and offensive line help at the top of the draft. And that's usually what happens. Whenever you're a team that's picking top 10, either you were bad up front or your quarterbacks were not very good. And that's what (laughs) we're seeing throughout the top 10 right now, just because we could have quarterbacks go one, two, three. And then after that, you're going to see wide receiver tackle, wide receiver tackle. It's going to be consecutively like that. So I just think it's a combination of teams at the top needing quarterback and offensive tackle help. And then also it being a strong class at wide receiver and offensive tackle too. Well, it's also funny because I think the entire buzzword from ownership and, and everybody, every time anybody's like, Oh, the buzzword is this. The only way a buzzword matters is if it's coming from ownership. And a lot of right. times, uh, a lot of times, and I remember talking to somebody about this a few years ago, and I've thought about it ever since it's borne out to be true. Like the reason teams create a plan at quarterback is because owners swing by the desk of the GM every couple of weeks and say, Hey, what's our plan at quarterback? If you don't have one and you better have yeah. one. That's why yeah. you end up if you're Jacksonville signing Nick Foles. Cause you're just like, I don't know. Here's a bunch yeah. of money to this guy. Cause we, we can't not have a plan at quarterback. And so secondarily, the, but the, I feel like, the whole thing now is support your quarterback, support your quarterback and, and give them, give them the tools. Don't end up having it be like Zach Wilson. Don't certainly end up like, uh, like Bryce Young last year, like give them a better line, give them skill guys. Um, Justin Fields going out and, and getting DJ more like that kind of thing. I think we're seeing, yeah. we're probably going to see more tackles, more wide receivers it, 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 after quarterbacks because all owners want to hear is like, what are we doing to let this, quarterback succeed and i think i i agree like the bad teams need offensive infrastructure before you can even see like i don't even know what the panthers do like they when when are they yeah. actually gonna get a read on bryce young without a first round pick if they can't improve the offensive line and and, and improve the skill guys like it's really astounding um what those sort of plans can even be jordan 
Yeah, I think the most surprising thing, and I said this at the time of the trade for the Panthers, is that you trade your best weapon knowing that that you're drafting a quarterback. Right. And, you know, there there was plenty of rumors of – they. so what I heard was they had the choice. Ryan Poles gave them the choice of DJ Moore or Brian Burns. Right. And they ended up selecting DJ Moore just because they needed help for Justin Fields. So what I never understood from the Panthers' perspective is that we know we're taking younger Stroud at the top of the draft. So – in my opinion, you probably would want to trade Brian Burns as opposed to DJ Moore. But now what we've mm-hmm. seen is – so in football, it's always been known as quarterback, edge, offensive tackle, cornerback. Those are like your four premium positions in football. Like if you're not good at any of those spots, you're not going to be very good in general. I now think wide receiver is a premium position. And we're seeing all these guys being drafted high consecutive years. We're seeing strong wide receiver classes. But the new trend in the NFL is like pairing your young quarterback with a first round mm-hmm. receiver or trading mm-hmm. for a prime time or big time receiver. We saw it with the Eagles with AJ Brown. They took Jalen the Dolphins took Jalen Waddle for Tua. The list goes on and on of how we've paired these wide receivers or big time wide receiver ones with young quarterbacks. So if I were the Bears and I select Caleb Williams, let's go ahead and get Romo Dunze or Malik Neighbors at number nine overall. Just build up that infrastructure of weapons just because wide receiver is such a premium position now. All right. So uh, I think every year I remember this was total luck. I remember it was on the Rich Eisen show the day of the Jordan Love draft. And he was like, Hey, give us like a wild prediction. And for some reason he was like, what's a team? Who's a team that's going to take a quarterback that we, we should we, that would surprise people. And I was just like, uh, the Packers, I literally just made it up. I was just like, I don't know. The Packers are getting up there. <laughs> And then I was like, I don't know, Jordan Love is like the third or fourth best quarterback. So like maybe Love to the Packers. And like I was so hedgy about it and like all this stuff. Mm. And then it happened and everybody was like, holy crap. And I was like, I promise you, I just made this up. And in the moment, I had no answer to this. But it's a real thing. Like succession plans are a real thing. And I'm curious, is there anybody getting up there in age or a young quarterback where it makes sense for a team to draft and either stash or start the succession project. So is there, you know, the let's assume Jaden Daniels is going really high. Okay. And, and mm-hmm. he's, he's in the top 10. He's going to a bad team. Is there a good team who might start the succession plan with one of these second tier guys? Um, do you have anybody in mind? And is there kind of a, a fit in, in your mind when you think about quarterbacks and, and maybe better teams late in the first? Well, one that really sticks out to me is the Saints just because we know the cap stuff that happens with them every year. Derek Carr, everybody can debate about Derek Carr as far as, far as how good they think he is, but them having a rookie quarterback, having that cap flexibility, we know that really would help them a lot. And Derek Carr didn't play very well last year, in my opinion. So them at 14 makes things really, really mm-hmm. interesting, whether it's Bo Nix or J.J. McCarthy or somebody like that. So, the Saints would definitely be my candidate that I would have circled for that. Can you um, – you mentioned Knicks and, and Michael Penix. What, where are they right now on everybody's board? Like I, you said that they've been a little bit of a disappointment. Does that mean like yeah. Penix is a day two guy and Bo Nix is late first? Like how, how do you – tie an account for me. So there's three guys that the league is all over the place on right now, Penix, Nix, and then also McCarthy. You ask some guys they like – they like Penix, and then you have some other guys that they like McCarthy and Knicks better. But McCarthy is just so interesting just because he hasn't played a lot of football, even though he's 27-1 and one in his career. He didn't – they didn't let him throw the ball a lot, and there's no secret about that. He, he's really, really inexperienced as a passer. But what I love about the NFL is that with quarterbacks, they love what's called – what I call the thrill of the unknown. So they mm-hmm. feel as if they always have the secret ingredients to help uncover yep. the potential – of these quarterbacks. And, you know, this happened with Josh Allen. Josh Allen is a great example of, you know, he's not very accurate, but eventually if we tutor this guy to eventually be what we think he can become, we just love this unknown factor that he eventually can be. And I'm not comparing JJ McCarthy to Josh Allen, just speaking into the thrill of the unknown. There's some coaches that just love the aspect and have the ego to feel as if, Oh, I can take on this guy and eventually turn him into a starter. So, I think that's what makes McCarthy really interesting. And then with Bo Nix, he's kind of in a similar situation of where they just didn't let him throw the ball down the field a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. Uh, His offense predominantly contained pre-snap read, quick throws, what I call grip it and rip it, just get the ball out, throw it as quickly as possible. 
an occasional deep shot down the field. Detroit Franklin is probably going to be a second round pick. Mm-hmm. And then just a bunch of quick screens. So I think once you take Bo Nix outside of that offense with how smart he is, I think he had like a 77% completion percentage or something outside, mm-hmm. insane this year. The accuracy, the decisiveness. I think he can be like a mobile Jimmy Garoppolo. That's kind of what I've been comparing him to. And, Whoa. I mean, I mean, he took you to a Super Bowl. Like there would be in his prime, Isn't there would be a lot Jimmy of mobile Jimmy Garoppolo, Brock Purdy. I mean, yeah, basically, <laughs> <laughs> pretty. No, yeah, I mean, he is, he is, he definitely is, and a lot of teams would take Brock Purdy right now. Sure. So I think sure. Nick is kind of that decisive, mobile guy that's very accurate that a lot of teams are gonna like, and you know, I've heard top fifteen buzz on him. Uh, people have been saying New Orleans at fourteen, Minnesota at eleven potentially. So there's a lot of mixed opinions. There's some other scouts that really like him. Uh, more so on the day two range, um, just because they think his ceiling is a little bit capped a little bit. But Penix is the one that's the ultimate wild card right now, just because of the medicals. Uh, but he has the arm strength that you love. He's a great kid, great leader. And you saw that at the Senior Bowl, has great, great intangibles. Um, but the the medical thing, that's something that um, he may get red flagged by some teams. All right, last thing for you before we get you out of here, you got you to gotta go to enjoy Mobile. What's the bar called? Beats? <laughs> is that what it's called that everybody goes to? Beats? Yeah. 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 All right. Um, gotta get you out to Veets. Uh, number one thing in your notebook that I did not ask about, that I did not tee you up on. What do you got? From the Senior Bowl or just in general? Yeah. No, just just from the Senior Bowl. Same thing you've learned this week. I didn't get to tee you up on. So I have a funny story, and this is like oh, my yeah. lifetime story at the Senior Bowl now. So there's a press box for like work and media that we go up to every year. So there's this long hallway at South Alabama and there's like suites for each team. So each team has their suite. And then the work and media is all the way at the end of the hallway. Of course they have like the glass in front of it to where you see the field. So I'm going to get a water uh, from the, the working area. Like they have refreshments up there and I turn around and I, I'm not looking, I just grab my water and I turn around. I don't think anybody is behind me. So I bumped shoulders with this guy accidentally. And I'm like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see who the guy was. So it ends up being Jerry Jones. Oh, no. <laughs> I bumped shoulders with Jerry Jones. And I'm like, oh, oh, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry, Jerry. I didn't. I said man at first because I didn't see who it was. And then I say, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Jerry. He's like, it's okay. It's okay. So he was walking with Will McClay, who was a high-ranked executive yeah, of course. for the Cowboys to their suite. So that happened during the first day of the draft. So that's like my lifetime story that I'll never forget about the Senior Bowl. Wow. All right. Awesome. Uh, Jerry, you're going to be good with Jerry Jones. He's already forgotten. Yeah. You're good. He's got a lot going on. Um, Jordan Reed, ESPN draft expert. We'll see you soon, buddy. Thanks as always, Kevin. 